Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by. This week I want to talk about something Quebec and Alberta have in common, separatist sentiment. So being a law student at the Université de Montréal, which obviously discuss you know, the referendum and separatist notions, and also looking at some of your comments, uh, which and especially in response to my equalization video tilted highly towards pro-separation, I wanted to explore whether Alberta could legally secede from federation, uh, drawing from the lessons we learned from Quebec's experience. I'm Sam and this is Chicks and Balances. So last November, an Ipsos poll suggested that prairie separation was at an all-time high. 33% of Albertans and 27% of Saskatchewans said that they wanted to separate from federation. That's an increase of 10% since 2018 and nearly double the number from 2001. And I can't help but notice the similarities between the way that Quebec politicians have been dangling separation as a as fodder for, you know, riling up Quebecers and the way that Albertan politicians are now using it as fodder to rile up the base. Even though Jason Kenney said that he doesn't think that separation is a solution for Albertans in regards to anything, he's still going to hold a referendum on equalization. A referendum that will likely get everyone angry and have no legal standing whatsoever. And so is this possible? Is this, you know, is have been talking about it futile? Is it politically salient? I think the answer is yes. So let's get into it. So the reason we know whether or not a province can legally secede from the Federation is due to a reference the federal government sent the Supreme Court. A reference is when a level of government sends a question, a legal question, to a court uh, to determine whether something is legal or legally viable or anything like that. So the federal government sent the Supreme Court two questions. Can Quebec leave unilaterally and can Quebec leave with the cooperation of other provinces and the federal government. What's interesting is that the Quebec government didn't even want the question to go up to the Supreme Court. Uh, Maurice Duplessis said, uh, La Cour suprême, c'est comme la Tour du Pise, ça penche toujours du même bord, which means that, you know, the Supreme Court is a federal court, so obviously they're going to tilt towards no. And a reason this is interesting is that despite, you know, international efforts to separate, um, Catalan, Scotland, and Taiwan come to mind. This is the first time that a federal court, a federal Supreme Court, has been asked to weigh in on the question. The Supreme Court elaborated on the two kinds of self-determination a nation can have. You have internal self-determination and external self-determination. The right to self-determination internally within one's borders is granted based on one's ability to amend one, one's own constitution. The right to self-determination as a country externally and by virtue of international law is granted based on three conditions. If the nation in question is a colony, if the nation in question is oppressed by a foreign power, and if the nation in question is being discriminated against within a larger country. So in this reference, the court had to determine whether Quebec had the right to secede unilaterally and whether their doing so was in line with the Canadian and international law. But it was clear by the end of the case that neither Maître Jolicoeur or the Supreme Court agreed that Quebec satisfied any of the external conditions for self-determination. Hence, unilateral secession was not possible. Quebec is not colonized, they are not oppressed by a foreign entity, or discriminated against within Canada. The latter could be argued, however, at the time of the reference, which is the question, the Supreme Court, the Chief Supreme Court Justice was from Quebec and the Prime Minister was from Quebec. The Supreme Court and the Attorney General of Canada both came down against unilateral secession. However, a pathway to internal self-determination was presented. The Supreme Court said that with a clear majority and good faith negotiations, even if Canada did not allow for unilateral secession, the Constitution could accommodate all changes by virtue of its amendment clause. Secession, in this case, may be an option. What's most interesting to me about this case is that um, in the response from the Supreme Court, they highlighted four major uh, constitutional conventions that have to be considered if a province decides to hold a referendum and eventually separate. I'm sure many of you know this, but the Canadian Constitution is made up of 
um, obviously the written constitution. So this is like the 1867 Constitution Act and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, etc. But it also includes inventions. So things that aren't written, that are just followed by virtue of habit, of political convention. Uh, nowhere in our constitution does it say that the prime minister has to, that a, the prime minister who has been ousted has to actually transfer power to another prime minister. The role of the prime minister is actually nowhere in our constitution, so it's all predicated on these uh, conventions. The first convention that the Supreme Court said needed to be held into account was federalism. Canada is a federal country. If a province is able to leave unilaterally, what does this mean for other provinces? And does it not embolden them to do the same whenever they have political grievances with Ottawa? This is one of the reasons the Supreme Court eventually said, no, a province can't unilaterally uh, separate because it would not only fragment the country, but just disrupt what a federation is fundamentally. Another convention that they had to take into account was democracy. Um, the Supreme Court thought it would be ill-advised and undemocratic to not heed people's choices. If Quebec came out, if Alberta came out and said, we want to separate from Canada, and those numbers were majoritarian, the Supreme Court has difficulty forcing those people against their democratic will to remain in Canada. So that's another reason why the Supreme Court gave conditions as to how Quebec could eventually separate you know, if the numbers were there, if the question was clear. And this is really interesting because this is the Supreme Court um, kind of solidifying the right to self-govern. If people want to leave and they're, you know, sufficient in numbers, you gotta let them do what they wanna do. We live in a self-government country, you know? And I think this is really, really interesting. Another convention is the primacy of law, right? This is another reason they said that you could not unilaterally secede because this would go against our constitution. And if you were able to circumvent the constitution by a simple majority, just on your own, well, then the entire idea of the rule of law would disintegrate within Canada and it would really just be chaos. The fourth and last convention that they brought up was the protection of minorities. Canada is made up of minorities. It's made up of Anglophone minorities in Quebec and Francophone minorities in the rest of Canada. As a country made of immigrants, you know, we all kind of exist in some sort of you know minority sphere so while the supreme court could not overlook the will of quebecers democracy isn't synonymous with majority rule it's much richer it's, it's much more complex and it carries other values and one of which is the protection of minorities and it's these four underlying constitutional conventions that brought us to a conclusion and the conclusion was again that a province could not unilaterally secede but a clear expression from Quebecers of no longer wanting to be a part of Canada requires that other provinces and the federal government come to the table in good faith to negotiate. Many constitutional lawyers and academics were quite surprised by the leniency of the Supreme Court, of the carefulness that they presented, but I imagine that many Federalists believed that the Supreme Court would just come down against it completely and not even give some sort of uh, pathway to secession, but they did. Um, they did their job. It, the Supreme Court's job isn't to wage political war on a province. It's not to uphold the political endeavors of our federal government. It's really just to read the law, interpret it in accordance to our true values, and give a simple and clear answer. And I think they really did this. Okay, so realistically, what would Alberta need for this to happen? First, Alberta would need the political will to do this. And this will would need to manifest itself in a ruling party. So in Quebec, you had Parti Québécois, which were obviously proponents of separation, but they took office and they were majoritarian more than once. The Maverick Party in Alberta, I don't think, or it doesn't seem to be, that they will ever you know, form government. Okay, say a separatist Albertan party did, you know, win a majority. Well, then they would have to put forth a referendum. But before the referendum, the House of Commons would have to evaluate whether the question on the ballot was clear. And this is according to the Clarity Act of 2000, which allows members of parliament to consider whether the question would result in a clear expression of the will 
of the population regarding separation. So then the province would hold the referendum. So once the votes were in, the House of Commons would have to look at the results and determine whether there is a clear majority. So this is a bit vague because when the Supreme Court came out with uh, this response to Quebec, Quebec's question on separation about you know a clear major a clear majority, they did not give any numerical value to this. So it's you know up to the interpretation of Parliament, which is a bit contentious considering you're asking the federal House of Commons. After all that was completed, negotiations to amend the constitution allowing Alberta to separate would begin. But this is also a bit complicated because you can't change the constitution unilaterally. So this would require negotiations both from provinces and the federal government. There would be a vote to amend the formula, which requires seven provinces that make up 50% of the population. So again, a lot of negotiation would, have to, would be involved, a lot of cooperation would have to take place. And I understand the grievance. I understand that Albertans and you know people from the prairies feel like they're not being respected or heard. But secession is a pipe dream at best. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think the majority the majority of Albertans want to separate. Um, especially in the prairies, people are pretty patriotic. Um, so I, I I don't see the political will being there. I don't see them getting a clear majority. I don't see, honestly, the rest of the provinces voting in favor of this. It, it just, it's, it's really, it really reminds me of what modern day Quebec politics is like, where you have, you know, the CAC and the Quebec Solidaire who are, you know, who have this like veneer of separation just to ensure that they get, you know, that separatist and thank God dwindling vote. Um, but it's never gonna happen. What the referendums did for Quebec were terrible. Well, maybe not for you know the separatists, but it shifted the economic center of Canada. Montreal used to be the economic center of Canada, and all of the Anglophones took their businesses and they went to Toronto. Now Toronto is the financial you know center of Canada, and Montreal has still not recovered. And I imagine this would happen to Alberta too. You'd see a lot of flight from Alberta. A likely condition of, of separation is assuming part of the federal national debt. So Alberta's debt would grow, which if I know my, my Albertans, this isn't something very palatable to them. And I am very happy to know that, at least in Quebec, and I think in Alberta, uh, notions of separation, of Wexit, of, you know, le Parti Québécois, um, these are all very, I think these are aging policies and ideas. I don't think young people um, at least I've never had a conversation, like a serious conversation about separation with like anyone my age. Uh, and I'm really glad that this, you know, this albatross in Quebec is disappearing and I'm saddened to see it coming to Alberta. And I'm sad to see that Albertans feel like they have no recourse but to actually leave Federation. I think that's, that's very, very troubling. I think the federal government should pay heed to this fact. Though it's legally possible, it's very difficult. It would be very difficult to go through the process of separating with a majority, with the political will, with the good faith negotiations of all provinces. Um, because even though in writing, people have to go to the table in good faith, I highly doubt that that would be the reality in, with any government, liberal, conservative, NDP. I think it'd be very hilarious if Quebec and Alberta decided to to separate together and then form their own country. If you think about it, if Quebec and Alberta left, Canada would just be like finance guys on Bay Street and like fishermen. I hope this short little constitutional conversation was informative and entertaining. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, please like, share, subscribe. Um, please support the Post Millennial by going to the links below, donating, subscribing. Anything you can do for us really helps us out. And I'll see you guys next week. Thanks.